Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. What's been really cool about these extra Friday edition podcasts is we have a chance to go into something a little different and a little deeper than the typical programming of the rest of the week. So for today, I'm beginning a series that's going to go on for the next few weeks. I'm going to take a step back from day-to-day -day politics. Of course, the midterms are coming up. And focus on a deeper topic like political philosophy. If you know me, you will know that I've always kind of struggled with the topic because I mostly lack the attention span to give the attention it deserves. So today I'm excited to speak with Jonathan B. Jonathan has an incredibly interesting course and lecture available on YouTube around the thought of Rene Girard. If you haven't heard of Rene Girard, he is a French philosopher from the 20th century who actually has been called Peter Thiel's favorite philosopher. You've probably heard reference to Rene Girard in our episodes focused on Peter Thiel's political views and approach to the world. There is a link to the lecture that Jonathan's released. And of course, you should check out the full course when it comes out in December. Hope you all enjoy this episode. And of course, if you want to support the show, check out our supercast at therealignment.supercast.com. Jonathan B., welcome to The Realignment. Hey, Marshall. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to speak with you. This is coming out on Friday, which is when I want to do these deeper, more introspective episodes. I think you're the perfect guest to kind of kick off that series. Let's start here. We're here to talk about your lecture series about the thought of Rene Girard that may, you know, prickle a couple audience members who are deeply read on the topics we focus on. If you've heard of Rene Girard before, but haven't delved deep into his thought, you've probably heard him mentioned in the context of being Peter Thiel's favorite philosopher. We've done a couple episodes on Peter, but I want to kind of start here. Listeners know this. I have very little interest at a literal level in political philosophy. Right. Two reasons. In my 20s in DC, I saw a lot of folks who kind of hid in philosophy, hid in the abstract as a way of kind of being a dilettante. But then too, and this is where I need to be self-aware, my uh, undiagnosed ADHD has made political philosophy from a reading perspective incredibly difficult. So from a perspective of self-criticism, I'm aware of the fact that I am probably confusing difficulty with not being useful. So can you just start here for the audience yeah. and for me? Like, Why do you think political philosophy is useful? Yeah. Especially for a show like The Realign, where we're trying to understand the world, things are changing, we're trying to be rooted. Like, what's the political philosophy pitch, you'd say? Yeah, yeah. Well, the first thing I, I, I'd say, uh, and this is going to be the annoying, philo the annoying philosopher's response, <laughs> is that the question of political philosophy's use for society is a question of political philosophy. Yes. <laughs> so if you wanted to argue that political philosophy has no use uh, in society, well, it seems to at least have one use, which is <laughs> which is to sort of prove its own uh, uselessness in a perhaps Wittgensteinian manner. The second thing I'll say is that I quite relate to your experience. Uh, you may be surprised about this uh, being disillusioned with people who have studied a lot in philosophy and perhaps the humanities at large. Um, in fact, I, I would probably agree strongly with that. I think what we have been doing uh, perhaps in the last, I don't know how far to extend, maybe 100, 200 years, is we've been producing sort of mediocre professionals uh, instead of true philosophers, so to speak. And I think philosophy is a discipline where the power law is in terms of its impact on society is greater than any, almost anything else, right? So let me give you a few examples. You know, if you're a software engineer and you're the 99th percentile, you're going to have a lot more impact than the 50th percentile. But, you know, uh, but if you're, a, if you're a basketball player, the 99th percentile, you're in the NBA. If you're 97th percentile, you're in the D League, you're not yeah. doing anything, right? And so the power law on basketball players is greater in, its, in terms of its impact in society than the power law of software engineers. And philosophers, I would wager, is, is on the extreme, extreme end. So we'll probably only you know, a few philosophers every century re really make any, any meaningful difference. And so, of course, if what you end up is mass producing uh, a bunch of uh, perhaps mediocre uh, philosophers because of the professionalization of the academy, I think that's what you tend to see. And so I actually 100% agree with you there. Um, but maybe to give you a much more direct answer, the way I've explained this before is that um, are, are you an engineer by any chance or are you familiar? No, I'm familiar I'm with a, tech. Familiar I'm a, with tech. I'm a, I, I'm, uh, I'm familiar with tech in the sense that a political science major who studies a space could be familiar with tech. Right, right. <laughs> well, then I think you'll, you'll catch on to this metaphor regardless, which is that there are different levels of frameworks in terms of how engineers interact with code, right? If you and I are going to be building our SaaS app, we're probably interfacing with a very high level framework to build our front end and back end. If you and I are building the next great ML algorithm or next robot, we're probably going very, very low level. 
right? Very low level in the assembly code and, and really getting really close to the hardware. And the idea is that there's a trade-off, it's very loose, between the flexibility of, of an engineering system as well as between its usability, right? So the high-level frameworks are super usable. There's a lot of these abstractions that you can readily use. But if you really want to be in the process of optimizing or really debug debugging things, you're not going to make that much progress. And I think the similar relation exists, uh, the similar relation between assembly code and high-level frameworks between political philosophy and actually political action. Uh -huh. That is to say, uh, political philosophy investigates the, the core ideas uh, uh, you know, you know, behind behind our speech, and as a result, if you if you do a good job of it, you can make a much more deeper uh, potential impact there. Um, if I can just give one, one example, um, the word innovation has had a almost exclusive exclusively negative connotation uh, up until perhaps the 18th 19th century. In fact, right after the Reformation, innovation was synonymous with heresy, and so uh -huh. you have these pamphlets, pamphlets, political pamphlets titled in, in Britain quite humorously to the modern eye you know, against the innovators or something like that, completely ludicrous. And so perhaps it's the change, uh, which is a political philosophical change in the idea behind innovation that actually uh, led to or, or spawned. Obviously, I think it went both ways, right? The actual innovation made, made the term more positive. And so it, it, I think it's this, these deep assembly code level, these deep source code level changes that allows a society to be able to make that's what I really find attractive about political philosophy, that uh, if you want to make political change, uh, even though it might be unintuitive, perhaps it's the, the deepest layer. And I think we're, we might see in our conversations today, I know you're really excited about talking about the economy, uh, how Gerard's sort of purely theoretical and seemingly useless different interpretation of the economy led to him uh, pr predicting something startling, which turned out to be right. What I'm really happy about from a perspective of looking at your answer is that you actually just responded very quickly with the point, which is that ultimately things that we don't think of as being political philosophy actually ultimately are political philosophy. Right. What is what is the good? Who is a citizen? What are the duties of a citizen to a non-citizen? So uh, right. that's that's just helpful as a very quick way of saying, Marshall, get serious with with your question, which I'm right. asking almost facetiously to a certain perspective. But let's get to the Rene Girard part. So Rene Girard. 20th century philosopher lives up until 2015, but the 20th century is a big century. A lot is, happens yes. in the space of philosophy. <laughs> I'm curious why you, out of all the different candidates you could choose from, why is Rene Girard the philosopher for this moment, or at least for your moment personally right now? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I don't know if if the I, I fully agree with the premise behind that question. I I'm quite engaged with I, I would say two strands of thinkers. One of them is actually Buddhist uh, Tibetan Buddhist thinkers. I, I was uh, in a Tibetan monastery in Nepal practicing for a few months actually just a couple of years ago. And the other strand is um, what are called the recognition theorists. So these are a whole set of philosophers. There's the German tradition, most notably Hegel, the French tradition, Sartre. Uh, Rousseau, and, and I would include Girard in them. Uh, and then there's the uh, Scottish moral tr tradition of philosophy, which is, uh, you know, human Smith. And all of these thinkers see humans not as economics and most uh, modern uh, intuitions would lead us to believe to be these rational utility maximizing creatures, but to be in some sense, deeply intersubjective creatures. Our, our sociality is what really defines us. I'm speaking very broadly, of course, for all these thinkers. And it's coming from a STEM background, from an economics and computer science background. It was that intuition that really upended a, a lot of what I thought man was, who man was, that really drew me uh, into all of these thinkers. And Gerard probably uh, being the one I've engaged the most with, um, but, but certainly uh, I, I wouldn't rule the, the other guys out. Um, but in, maybe in terms of, to give you one answer of how Gerard even separates himself, even amongst these thinkers, is, uh, well, Gerard is much younger uh, than these thinkers. And a lot of his comments, and hopefully we'll get to this today, will seem deeply prescient in his analysis of progressive movements, reactionary movements, modernity's uh, fetishization of the victim, um, as well as his apocalyptic predictions. That's something I, I think is quite unique about Gerard. I think it's a bit humorous that Almost every age before us thought the world is going to end, uh, almost ex except for our age, you know. But but even sort of one generation prior to us, they were worried about nuclear apocalypse. But I think you, you and me, Marshall, and maybe I'm speaking uh, uh, for you here. We, we didn't grow up with that apocalyptic fear. Um, I think we grew up way past the, the sort of nuclear worries. Uh, and 
and uh, and Gerard is someone who takes apocalypse very but very literally and as a result very seriously. And so that that's something I'm I'm quite interested in and, and frightened by, of course. So two questions to follow up then. So first one would be what is Girardian thought? That's a big right. question. So feel free to go as long as you need to go. But then two, if you could weave this second question into your answer, describe the world that Rene Girard is responding to. He's French. I've seen you speak about this in the lecture today, but they were probably thinking about both the Nazi occupation of France, but also the response by French citizens after the Nazis leave France. So just try to help us understand those two things, because I'm just at a personal level. I'm really interested in the idea that philosophers are, are obviously contributing, but they're responding to moments yeah. and times that maybe even to your point, if I'm not thinking about the apocalypse because I was born at the end of history 1990s. If right. you're a person who lives through both World War II and then also the Cold War, apocalypse is going to be at the forefront of your thought. So answer that however you want to. Yeah, maybe I'll just briefly touch upon the latter because I think the, the former might take up the rest of, the, of, of, this, <laughs> of this podcast. Um, so Gerard was born before World War One. Oh, sorry, before World War II. Um, his, his parents were both academically inclined in some way. And his dad really had a negative view to, to warfare. He thought it was quite uh, you know, stupid. It might be a strong word, but I, but I think perhaps it's fitting here, uh, pr- pr- trivial and pointless. And he got that from World War One, and definitely growing up in his formative years. I think he was going to college, I believe, um, during Nazi occupation didn't didn't help and really cemented that. So Gerard and the the point that you were trying to make here was obviously, you know, as anyone growing up in that uh, time period in, in occupied France would have observed is uh, the cruelty of the Nazis and how senseless that, that was. But I think what Gerard also observed is after the French resistance that took back power when the Allies pushed back the Nazis, that the French resistance really committed a lot of the, maybe not certainly not to the extent and not as horrendous, but in terms of the form of the crimes that people attribute to the Nazis, i.e. scapegoating and casting blame on folks, um, that the French resistance were, were guilty of this as well. There's many stories of very innocent women who were just seen to be too proximate to the German soldiers. Now, some of them actually you know, slept with the German soldiers willingly. Some were forced to. Some were just you know, just didn't do anything with them. But it was that sort of French mob mentality, perhaps one that we shouldn't be too surprised with, given the French Revolution, that ended up uh, often parading these, these women in a terrible fashion uh, and then beating, and beating them sometimes to death. And I think what that made Gerard realize is really the likeness of, of enemies. Gerard has this uh, important motif of the warring twin, how people who are diametrically opposed uh, who consider themselves diametrically opposed, engage in warfare, are really, you know, very similar uh, or similar in certain aspects. Um, and so I think he grew up in that chaotic, senseless world, in a world where people weren't really governed by their reason or their appetite, but were really governed by their spirit, right? Thumos, the part of the soul that seeks the social goods of glory, revenge, uh, uh, catharsis. Uh, and I think that's what uh, um, led to a lot of his philosophy. He ended up moving to to America, and that was a, a re- relatively peaceful and uneventful time. That that, that he that, that he, uh, but it, it was also the Cold War, right? So I think the <laughs> apocalypse was was on his head. And maybe I'll, I'll answer the first question, but I'll, but I'll just give you because I think we have so much to talk about, uh, both yeah. the, maybe the economics and then the apocalypse. I'll just give you Gerard's core insight, and then you'll be able to see, hopefully through the rest of the interview, how that. Uh, enabled him to see the world in a different, interesting theoretical way that led to sort of really practical uh, practical insights. So Gerard essentially considers that, uh, that there are two species of human desire. One species he called physical desire, and the other he called metaphysical desire. Physical desire is aimed at utility. So what an object can do for me. If I want to take a, a drink out of this jug, right, the physical uh, utility of this water is to quench my thirst. Now, metaphysical desire is what an object says about me. So physical desire is utility. The metaphysical desire is aimed at identity. I might be uh, concerned about drinking from this jug on this on this podcast because it's quite <laughs> dirty, and I don't want people to to you know I think I'm I'm some kind of unkempt kind of person. And you know this expands across multiple domains. Uh, you know one I think provocative and interesting one is in sex. Right, we can pursue sex out of 
physical desire, and that would be for the pleasures of the orgasm or intimacy. Uh, but we can also pursue it out of metaphysical desire. And that would be for who, uh, for what having sex with a certain type of person says about us. Right. Okay. And as you, as you probably know, this is a real psychology. This is the psychology of the Don Juan or the coquette. Um, and this extends to many ulti- other domains as well, like a job, right? Are you doing the thing, doing the job because it's a cool job or are you doing the job because you like the activity or you think it's, it will meaningfully con- contribute to society. And as you can tell, these parts are almost warring, competing for real estate in Gerard. And just maybe as a small digression, you know, I, uh, a lot of my friends are investment banking uh, and maybe it was different in a different age, but now almost all of them are purely motivated by metaphysical design, right? What the job says about, about someone who's in investment banking. And in some sense, that's unavoidable because the utility of the job is so boring, right? Or at least now you're just making the same spreadsheets over and over and over again uh, and not really seeing that much impact. So uh, maybe I misspoke there. I, I've never been in, in an investment a banking inter, uh, job, but that's what I hear. I've but heard. Those I, can, are the, I, can, I, I can double fact check verify that is, this is right. what I've also heard as well too. Right, <laughs> right. And, and so I think what's, unique and, and interesting about this view of human nature, as you think, well, so, so what, right? Who, who cares? Is this metaphysical desire is really, really malleable. And what it ends up meaning is that we tend to imitate those we consider who have a heightened degree of being um, and simply like the values or objects that they like. And I think Gerard wants to use the malleability of this metaphysical desire, this desire to be what an object says about me, uh, to explain really the kaleidoscope of, of human cultures and, and how human values can be so drastically different, right? Right now we value skinniness for beauty, but in the Tang Dynasty in China, it was you know opulence. It was uh, it was being larger that that, that was valued. Um, and what I think is so interesting uh, about this theory of human nature is that it fundamentally sees humans as social creatures, right? Concerned with what an act primarily says about them in a social context rather than what an act uh, can do for them. Okay, so a million questions in response to that, but here's the first one you mentioned in the first lecture series, which I pointed this out in the intro, is available on YouTube. It's linked in the show notes that Rene Girard is pursuing these insights and feels like outside of his direct line of study. So it's not yes. like he's literally an evolutionary psychologist making yes. these claims about what is normative versus what is the word isn't like quite a social construction, given what you're describing, but one could translate what you just said about how in the Tang Dynasty, you know, there's different body standards in, let's say, New York City 2022. That's a social right. construction. So how does he know this? Or like, why does he come to this conclusion? Right. And I'm not asking you in the sense of like, he has a PhD in blank. I'm just like, how does he yeah, yeah, yeah. come to this conclusion? Right. Well, well, the first thing that I'll say is um, perhaps this narrow focus and specialization wanting Gerard to have a degree in evolutionary psychology is contributing to the very sort of lacklusterness of humanities professionals you're seeing in DC, that we're sort of forcing people to study these narrow disciplines and picking narrow dissertations within these already very narrow disciplines. Uh, but that's a digression. And, uh, you know, Gerard himself, uh, I believe, studied to be an archivist in France. So this is like a cross between a historian and a librarian. And then he, when he came to America, um, he got, a, I believe, a PhD in history in, in <laughs> Indiana University. But eventually, in all the spheres he did make contributions to, philosophy, anthropology, uh, psychology, literary criticism, he did not have a degree in all, he's, so he, in either of them. So he's very self-taught. And furthermore, as you, I think, correctly pointed to, the breadth of Gerard's work is very unusual for a modern uh, academic. And in fact, his first books were on psychology, and then his next book, Violence in the Sacred, was in anthropology. And people were like, you know, what is old, good old Gerard doing, right? And may, say, to, to give you, to answer this directly about this metaphysical desire and how he came to the uh, this mimetic hypothesis, um, he did it uh, by reading literature. So he he very closely read uh, great the great literary works, whether it's Dostoevsky or it's Shakespeare. And he found that there was always a triangle forming uh, amongst the protagonists, mediating uh, each other's desire. And it was through this insight that allowed him to see the relationship in the real world. And maybe the one thing I'll say uh, in defense of this is, I think for a lot of philosophers, and this might make you even more disillusioned about political philosophy, 
what they're ultimately giving is a what I called a hermeneutical argument. That is to say, like, I can't give you a mathematical deductive proof from first principles of what you're asking here. But what I can do is try to paint as good a picture as I can. And then you go, you go apply that to the real world and you tell me whether it's accurate and useful. So in some sense, uh, I can't really give you one, you know, A squared plus B squared equals C squared, you know, second, right. da, 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 um, to get you to this mimetic hypothesis. Uh, however, this entire podcast and the lecture series, if our audience watches it, is is that proof, if that makes sense. It, like the, the convincingness and the revel- how degree to which Gerard is revelatory compared to our old world ways of thinking about the world should constitute the proof in and itself. For sure. So then we're going to get to the econ side and the China side, but I just have one quick question that I wanted to follow yes. up on from the, le- from the lecture. So as you articulate, you had two goals with this lecture series. One was just providing a theoretical overview of Gerard's work in theory, but then two, the, the, the practicality side, how the system applies to your life. We're going to do all the heady stuff in the second half of this episode, but I wanted you to speak a little bit about your college experience. This was the interesting section between you and David, where you kind of in your trying to find yourself as one does during an undergraduate, you kind of experienced both ends of mimetic theory, dropping out to like launch a startup and then kind of overcorrecting when you came back. So can you give right. just like the pure practical personal life side, then we'll get to the really theoretical as regards yeah, yeah. China and I'd love to, I'd love to, yeah. And so um, I think we should uh, probably start by fleshing out the theory a little bit because I think yeah, it'll make my, life journey, make my life journey a bit more uh, understandable. So what we discussed so far about basically wanting objects like models who we think have a heightened degree of being, that's what Gerard called the positive phase of mimesis, right? This is like me, you know, thinking very highly of you, Marshall, and this, and thinking maybe I should get a, a, a turquoise polo shirt after this <laughs> as well or something like that. Um, now, one only needs to flip this logic to get to what we call the negative phase of mimesis, and that's to uh, not have the objects that are associated with people we consider to have a deficiency in being. So, you know, the one liner I give is, you know, we both want to dress like the cool kids in school, but we also want to make sure that we don't dress like the social outcasts. Yes. And, and both of them uh, give, give, give uh, help around, draw it around out the degree to which we are social beings. Uh, in my own life, uh, I really liked uh, your emphasis on the practical because I got into Gerard because of the practical. Uh, I, I started at Columbia. I dropped out my freshman spring to run a startup, raise friends and family, ended up failing. And I immediately got into philosophy to try to self-diagnose myself, almost as if I was a broken software and I was an engineer trying to debug it. Uh, and the reason was because the failure was so internal. You know, it wasn't like I really wanted to do the startup. And, you know, I tried, I tried, and we, we were hiring well, and, you know, I was aligned, but, you know, the external circumstances just didn't come through. It was more of an internal failure. It was more like I could feel I was being pulled towards doing something that I didn't really want, want to do. And because it was an internal failure, I wanted my way of diagnosis to be equally as internal, which is why, you know, meditation, psychotherapy, philosophy. And what I eventually, and this is why Gerard spoke so hev- so so dearly to me, is that I was really mediated by these entrepreneurs growing up that at the time, I didn't really have a physical desire for building startups, but a mes- metaphysical desire to be an entrepreneur. And that's why there was such a big difference between my stated desires of wanting to drop out to do build a startup and my day-to-day reality. You know, maybe I think we, we all know those, those days where we're just dreading at, dreading getting up from bed and, 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 and doing that work. Um, and to your second point, when I went back uh, into the academy, I think because of my failure, I went the opposite direction. I, I rejected the worldly altogether. Uh, and you know, I completely sort of ignored everything that had to do with tech. And I switched uh, completely to philosophy and ended up going to that Tibetan monastery, uh, like you described. And I, you know, obviously I, I like philosophy and, and, and meditation, but I think that was an overcorrection because it was almost out of resentment that by by rejecting the worldly, I can portray myself as superior and almost use my failure as a as a moral weapon. Um, and, and maybe I'll, I'll give you one, one example to explain what what I mean there. So I had a college acquaintance um, when I got to know as a freshman. He was a uh, economic progressive, right? So this is someone who cares a lot about distributive justice, high tax for the rich. And I thought, what a great guy. And when I got to know him a bit better, he confessed to me that his uh, progressivism 
did not come from a universal benevolence, but a localized hatred. It didn't come from a universal concern for the poor, but a local hatred of the rich. See, he had grown up in as a middle class person in an upper middle class, upper class community. And he was always made to feel lesser uh, because of money. So his rejection of money and the, and the life in pursuit of money was not a rejection of the life itself, but a moral weapon. So he can now be better than his more richer peers. Does that make sense? So, so yeah, in, so in then, this case, right, it's equally as socially determined, even in, even though it's a breaking away from the group, right? And, and we would say, oh, Jonathan's so independent. He went to a monastery while all his friends were building companies. Gerard points out, no, that's equally as derivative, but just in the opposite direction. At the end of the day, you really shouldn't care about your vector towards the group, but what is determining that vector? As, as long as your vector, you, yeah, but I'll, I'll pause there to see if that, when that you, you kind of You kind of got to the question I was going to ask then. So is it's not as if this is purely like self-help, but it seems like the goal then of internalizing mimetic insights is just the idea of like centering where your desires and objectives are coming from. And that one who is aware of both those negative and positive aspects will be in a good position. I don't mean that in a career sense, but just will be right. centered. How should, how would you articulate what I'm kind of trying to get at? Yeah. Yeah. I think there's really two solutions and I'm not fully decided on which one is right yet. The first solution is try to try to extinguish metaphysical desire. And I think, you know, if I'm being honest, this is what Gerard and certainly someone like the Buddhists would want. And the idea here is that, you know, any instance of metaphysical desire is bad, even if it is aligned with your physical desire, right? Even if you have a strong physical desire to work out, if you also have a strong metaphysical desire to work out, it might push you beyond the bounds of what is uh, actually good for you by, for example, making you inject steroids. Um, the second line of thinking is what I'm actually uh, yeah. practicing day to day <laughs> um, is to, to simply align them and just to tame the more inflammatory manifestations of metaphysical desire. So the idea here would be to surround yourself with, uh, to, to first of all, figure out what your physical desires are. And, and, and there, I think we can, in a medic world, peel out the layers, so to speak, and understand what that true vector is, right? If you think of this ultimate vector of desire as having two components, if you have a guess of where that metaphysical vector is, you can sort of subtract that and, and realize where the physical vector is. And the goal would be simply to uh, surround yourself in an environment or build an environment where your metaphysical desire aligns well with your physical desire. And, and you know, for people like us, maybe it's surrounding ourselves with con contemplatives or people who also like sharing ideas, right? And, and to... And to, and to exist in this sort of like effortless flow flow type of way. Um, but that's certainly uh, the strategy that I've converged to. One last follow up on this, and then we'll get to the weighty stuff. Can you actually define what physical desire is? I think we kind of, especially yeah. with your articulation, I get me met metaphysical, like I want to feel cool. I want to be, right? but what is the, yeah, what is actually- I want to exist in great measure, or that's metaphysical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so what physical, physical desire is, I, I just want to say it's like a, Here's a great here's a great um, anecdote that Gerard said. Uh, Gerard said, "Have you heard the story about Romans being bulimics? That no. the Romans would th would, would throw up um, so that they could eat more." Oh yes, yes, um, yes, yeah. Right. And I think that's that, that's a rumor, by the way. But Gerard <laughs> called those Romans innocent sensualists. So what he's saying there is that the Romans there aren't throwing up because you know they're worried having a bigger waistline would impact how they consider themselves, but they just want more hedonism, <laughs> essentially. And I think part of that hedonism is what, what I'm getting at in physical desire. Like just the uh, innocent, and here I'm using innocent as a, a lack of a concern for the social, the Bad. innocent concern for your experience. And if that's too theoretical, it's, you know, just getting pleasure when no one's looking, right? Like, like if you could uh, have sex with this person or eat this pile of spaghetti with, with no one looking, would you do it? If the answer is yes, then, then that's probably that's a, a lot that's of it. That's, that's a great, desire, that's right? a, that's a right. great, that's a great metaphor. Okay. That's helpful. Right. Right. So it's, it's, a, it's about the experiences offered by the, the object itself. So, you know, again, driving a car, uh, I can, even if I'm buying like a sports car, like a, I don't know, I'm not a big, not a big car person. If I get a Ferrari, if I, what I really like is just the experience of driving it around the Nürburgring and, and trying to set new, new, new records. Um, and, and I'm not sharing this with anyone. I'm perfectly happy with, 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 with it just being like a weekend activity. Then yeah, that's probably mostly physical desire. You like the adrenaline of driving a race car and that's in the moment. That doesn't have that much to do with your being. 
But if what you really want is to drive it on the streets of Monaco and then show off your cool car and see and be seen, then yeah, that's probably metaphysical desire. So I, I, ho- I hope that clarifies that. No, perfect. And that sets us up well for like the, the two big topics here, like China and then obviously um, apocalypse. Let's start with China. Key insight here. Folks have listened and are listening at this point are going to think like, okay, like where is the possible pivot between the Girardian thought that you've articulated and the China topic? Well, tell the 2007 story. That's how I'll set you up. It's kind of a softball, but just really articulate like what G- Gerard's insights provided someone looking at the U.S.-China relationship in the early 2000s. Yeah. And uh, not to be annoying here, but if it's okay, I would like to give an overview of Gerard's understanding of, e- of economics and what, yep. what capitalism, what is the fundamental motor of capitalism. And I think the, the China uh, practical applications will, will naturally follow. So Gerard traces um, the genealogy of capitalism to gift giving. So I think there's a popular misconception, probably popularized by people like Adam Smith, that uh, have you heard like, you know, we started off bartering. And then we invented money, right? And then we have our market economy. Uh, Gerard would agree with someone like Graeber here that it's actually flipped on its head, that we actually started with gift giving, like a debt debt system, uh, and then we invented money. And it's only when we're already in a market system and people take out money do we barter, like in prisoner of war camps. Uh And so the real genesis of the current economy, Gerard traces it back to gift giving. And this is quite a natural uh, understanding of human relations, I would think. Because, you know, Marshall, let's say you and I were friends and I say, hey, can you host me on this podcast or can, can you retweet this, this one thing when I'm probably going to be these lectures? You don't go, oh, well, yes, I will do it if you do this exact other thing for me, right? You'll say, I'll do it. But if I keep asking you these favors without giving you anything in return, then you're like, well, maybe I'm being abused in this relationship, right? So, and if, the point there is that in intimate relationships, friendships, romantic relationships, um, the the natural intuition is to extend favors for others, hence gift giving. But at the end of the day, this gift giving needs to be balanced in some way. Uh And Gerard's point is that for pre-money societies, this was how the quote unquote economy worked. Your neighbor needed help and you provided to them. It was almost like a primitive communism, right? To each according to his uh, need and from each according to his ability. Um, And there's two interesting things about this gift giving economy. The first interesting thing about this gift giving economy is that what what, what appeared to be or what started off as a material exchange, an activity primarily for material exchange became something for uh, to express one's social desires and gain social recognition. And that's, again, ties back all the way back to the, the psychology, because it's not just the physical desire. Right. It's not just wanting two chickens to eat them, but what having two chickens says about a firm farmer in, uh-huh. in rural, I don't know, Pakistan or something. So this all ties back to that core insight. And let me just I'll, I'll give you some very far out examples there to give you an insight. There are these rituals where these chieftains are expected to, to, to give away so much um, that there are times where. There were stories told where one person received a gift so good they could not reciprocate. They eventually killed the gift giver, okay. right? which, which is completely alien to our modern conception. Because that's, that would be like if you gave me a Lamborghini and I can't give you anything back and I would kill you. Then the person like, well, he gave you a Lamborghini and you killed him. The idea is this. By you giving me a Lamborghini that I can't reciprocate, you're proving yourself to be a, a bigger man. Better. And I think this intuition also exists in modern philanthropy, right? That many, many of the times, or, or certainly it's not all about helping those who are receiving, but it's about showing the person who's giving that they are, uh, you know, a great, a great man or woman. So that's the first insight. What, what appears to be a purely material uh, arena actually is about a trafficking of social rewards. <laughs> the second important insight is that there usually had to be, whether pres- pres- prescribed by ritual or tradition, a long, uh, there had to be long periods of gaps uh, between gift and counter gift. That is to say, if I come and say, hey, uh, Marshall, can you, can you retweet this, this, this Twitter thread? You don't immediately come back and ask for one favor. Well, first of, of all, be, be, yeah, exactly, thing. exactly. exactly. Yeah. That sort of cuts off the relationship again, right? And, and importantly, Gerard thinks, you know, if I offer something to you two months here and you offer something right away, 
we will be upset by the differences. And, and both of us may, 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 may think other, the other one had an advantage. And that, because of that rapidity of reciprocation, that could escalate to violence. But if you know, I give you something, you ask for something roughly equal two months, three months from now, and that sort of continues, that's how violence can be contained. Mm-hmm. Now, the introduction of money, what it allowed is that it allowed the cutting off of the exchange. So it allows us to both agree on what an equal amount is and to cut off our relationship right now, right? Uh-huh. When I go to the halal cart guy down the street, I don't want to form a relationship with him, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so the way I do that is by paying him yes, <laughs> because, because that cancels out the debts. And, and so, you know, th- this is perhaps why this lends to the reading that the modern economy with money is really an, an atomistic economy where it cuts off all the social relations uh, that are sort of cut off, whereas there would have been standing debts and thus social uh-huh. relationships there. But as a result, what money allows us to do is to transact much more, much more frequently and with much less violence. So the transition from gift economy to the uh, modern day capitalism, and eventually get to China, I promise, no, um, no, soon, is, um, is really with the introduction of money. So modern capitalism, the market economy is unlike the gift economy in that there's rapid exchange, but it is like the gift economy in that what appears to be material, a material arena is actually arena to traffic social rewards. Gerard had, had, had this one liner. He said, it's little wonder that as heroes and warriors ran, uh, went out of style, the European aristocrats so readily found themselves in business, right? I think there was this funny story about how like, I don't know, Bon Bonaparte and one of his enemies grandsons no, were like it's, on, it's, on opposite uh, trading desks it's, it's, right? it's, it's well it's well it's uh i think it's wellington and uh uh yeah the duke of wellington and napoleon bonaparte's like descendants are both like traders in london which exactly. is both which is both you know the meme of you know men used to do x now they do y lame thing right, right. Um, they are cell jockeys but there's something there <laughs> yeah and so gerard actually sees uh, modern in capitalism in the market economy as the channeler uh, and productive director of violence. The idea here is that um, it's, it's the same sort of social drives that, that drove Napoleon to, to you know, come back and, and invade France after he was in exile, that drove Caesar to catch, capture Vercingetorix, that drove Germany into Poland and eventually France, where you know, Gerard lived under occupation. It's those same drives. It's not the concern for material goods that fundamentally motivates the world economy but a drive for social recognition simply manifested in the material realm. And I think there is some plausibility. If if you talk to a lot of founders these days, you would think, well, these are the exact type of people who would have raised an army. For a non-tech audience, you mean founders of like a tech company. Tech tech companies, exactly. Right. You'd be like, okay, these guys are the exact people who in the Roman uh, Imperium or the Republic would have raised armies and gone to Gaul. Right. It's, it's that exact same personality that today would start companies that would sort of lead armies to, to Gaul, I, I, I would wager. And so, so that's Gerard's reading of, of the economy, right? That is that's something Can fundamentally quick, true. Can we, can yeah, we do a total go, just digression? Yeah, yeah. I'm curious. just digress, digress. Because I've, I've, I've heard this framework before. What I kind of wonder about that being true is founders, especially in this era of Silicon Valley, tend to be technical. And like you're coming from right. a computer science background. I am skeptical of the personality of an engineer as being the right. personality that want to conquer Rome. Right, I would say right, 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 a right. robber baron, I could see Rockefeller wanting to conquer Gaul or go into Britannia or yeah, whatever. Yeah. But what are you as someone who like literally is in that you, your 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 type of founder engineer is most rewarded in this context. Like, what do you think about that reframe? Yeah, that, that that's quite interesting. So, first, I would say that uh, one's mathematical ability and analytical skill has almost never been rewarded as heavily and as um, predictably as it is today. Um, and and that's true. I think across society, I agree with you that. The, eng- the canonical engineering archetype does not map really well with the uh, sort of Caesars of the world who, who conquered Gaul. But I think when you peek behind the hood, those people who, even if they have engineering degrees, like Zuckerberg, for example, he studied uh-huh. computer science and psychology, they aren't really those engineers that you have in mind. 
You see what I'm trying to say? What, oh, like, so, like, right. like, so, so like the, the, has the, written the, code at Meta for like 10 years. Like, it, exactly, the, exactly. <laughs> like, or, or um, who else has a CS degree? Um, uh, well, he, here's the other thing, right? Most of these guys have philosophy degrees, like Reid Hoffman, Alex Karp, Peter Thiel. Um, but yes, maybe the super, but even, even for the super technical founder who's, who's still engaged day to day, oh, Elon is a great example, right? He's still engaged in engineering. I think he still has the disposition of a, of a world conqueror, right? And, and that is to uh, desire glory and desire to, to dominate, right? And so it's that dimension of their personality and not necessarily their quantitative skill set that I'm trying to emphasize. With okay. That. Yeah. Just because like, you know, you, this is your background, obviously, but you know, you, you were, you were a serious like math Olympiad, um, you know, uh, ach achiever uh, in, in Canada. So I was just curious what, given your background, how you would think about that concept. Yeah. 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 And, and I think the math Olympiad kids, they, they really go into two directions, right? Basically, if you track the Olympiad kids, they either end up building companies uh, or, or being, doing something in industry, or they go into research. And mm -hmm. even though, uh, you know, at least at the time, the mathematical abilities between the two groups were very similar, these, these, these are people with very, very different dispositions, That's right? Uh, and in fact, in, in Rome, they would separate it into the, the active life and the contempl contemplative life, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think you have this intuition, right, of these, you know, professors. And, and some of these professors are out to dominate, but generally people who go into the academy are, are much more leisurely, you know, they're, they're much more, uh, you know, uh, turned in inwards into themselves, not as engaged with society. And then you have people who like love hosting. And, uh, yeah. and so I think there is a difference there. And so, so let me get to the, yeah, the please China get back piece. to your actual. So, so the, no, no worries. The insight that we landed upon, right. Is that uh, perhaps it's not, or cer certainly it's incomplete to view the economy simply as a bunch of rational utility maximizing agents trying to pursue things. Where in fact, perhaps you should view a great part, if not most of the, of the economy, as social spirited animals trying to win social glory in the same way that one would raise an army and go to Gaul and Rome. And this insight, right, of, of what is fundamentally underlying uh, the economy and what do people really want to get from it is, I think, what led Gerard to be able to see a rift forming in geopolitics where other people didn't even know they were standing on a fault line. So if you recall, in the 90s and certainly in the 2000s, the dominant position of, uh, of, of uh, most people in the West was that the economic liberalization of China would lead to a, a greater harmony between the two nations, right? Or between, the, between the East and the West, essentially. And I think Gerard saw this as grounded upon two fundamentally wrong premises. One premise that this is wrong, no, so the first premise this is grounded on is the idea that the rising tide lifts all boats. The idea went something like, you know, as the Chinese get integrated into the economy, the Americans are going to get cheaper goods and the Chinese get, are going to get richer. It's a win-win, right? And the, the second idea is that, you know, as China liberalizes, that it opens its markets and its culture into Western influence, uh, as, as their elite desires to send their kids to Ivy Leagues and watch the NBA, a more similar set of values will, will, will make the two uh, superpowers more harmonious. To the first point, Gerard says, uh, because we are these relative creatures, right? These social creatures who are primarily concerned with our you know, social standing, even if that is true, and it did turn out to be true, where China would be lifted, lifted up and America would be lifted up because of the cheaper goods, what, is, what the Americans are gonna focus on is less so their increase in absolute goods, but the fact that they are that the absolute the relative distance between China has decreased, and that's what they're going to focus on and be scared of. And the same idea goes for China, that the Chinese are going to, not going to be so much happy about the increase in absolute goods, but because they are actually closer to the Americans, they're actually more prone to comparison and become becoming envious. Right? This was the famous Tocqueville principle that he observed in America that in yeah. Europe, when when the gap was super wide between social classes, inequality didn't matter as much. But in America, when everything is on a leveling playing field, the small, the smallest of differences creates the greatest amounts of distress. And to the second point, this Gerard is why thinks keeping that, up with the Joneses is an American concept, obviously. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. That's precisely right. And to the second idea, 
Gerard thinks, you know, while this is not always true and we don't have to get into the, the nitty gritty of it, he thinks that often it's people who are similar, who are warring against each other. So the fact that, you know, Chinese parents want to send their kids to Ivy Leagues, that they now, you know, watch the NBA are, are also technologically, materialistically oriented towards the future. That's actually going to cr- increase the surface area of competition between the two powers. So he actually predicted that in 2007, right? And this is the height of Sino-American optimism, right before 2008, uh, Beijing Olympics, and where the motto was Beijing Huanying, or Beijing welcomes you. It's, uh, it's supposed to be this great harmonious moment. Gerard very ominously and turned out to be accurately predicted that US and China will enter into conflict, that this conflict will not be a clash of civilizations. It won't be two things that are radically different, but because of the two countries being too similar to each other. And third, uh, that, that it will really come from the economic domain first, that because economics is where uh, national pride is piled up, it'll begin sort of with a, with a trade war. And so he anticipated the Sino-American trade war in, in a time where you know, most people, that, that would have been quite ludicrous. At the that, time. Is, that is such an interesting, I'm just reacting to this live. That's such an interesting nuanced point because look, we're, we're looking at the, a potential Taiwan crisis, but there were Taiwan crises in the nineties. Um, in there were, you know, there was the Huainan Island in 2001, where, you know, a, a, a Chinese jet like ran into uh, a, a U.S. surveillance plane and there could have been a diplomatic incident, but it was to your point, those are subsumed. No one remembers those two incidents I just referred to, just like the story of a trade war being so central. It's like, I didn't think about it that way, but that's, I guess, to your point here, whether we're looking for frameworks to look at the world that we're seeing in front of us from a different perspective. So in, in, in this last section, let's get to, I'd say the most news you can use, which is this right. topic of the apocalypse. And I want to push back on you for a second. You said Please, earlier yeah. in the podcast, quote, you know, as children of the nineties, or early two thousands, you probably haven't, you know, thought about the apocalypse, but right. I will tell you the past eight, nine, 10 months I've got, because oh. of the fact that I do this podcast talk about foreign policy, the war in Ukraine, those topics. I've got a huge number of, of just friends and, and listeners and viewers like reaching out about nuclear war and concerns as a general feeling. So right. I guess your point is that you weren't literally saying it's never happened, but we're just kind of in this oh, period oh, of transition. That, yes, it's exactly. Still, our, it's, it's, you, you see, yeah, this, the point is our childhood, I did not think of nuclear yeah, apocalypse it, it, exactly, in 2004. Exactly. In fact, you know, when I first made these lectures, I made them last holiday season. Um, I was worried that when I published them, people would think that it was crazy. He was talking about at the end of the world and nuclear war. And obviously Ukraine happened. And now when I'm publishing them a year later, I'm worried people are going to consider it's trivial, right? Of course, of course, nuclear war, right? Do you seem like- That is, let's pause there because yeah. as a- host and a booker, that was a good insight of the concern. But it's not that you don't come off as crazy, but if I'd seen your work and you talked about apocalypse in December, 2021, I would have thought, okay, this guy could be a crank. Right. right. That's yeah, a, yeah, yeah. But, One but, of those nasty political philosophy people. Yeah, you yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, like, right. But you're, <laughs> right. you're so, man, you're so, but now, okay, so let's talk about the reception then. What yeah. we, we've run the experiment, the, you know, the, the lecture has more of a decent number of views. How did the audience react to the apocalypse concept? Well, really we'll have to see because as you know, we're releasing the rest of the lecture series. Um, so the, the first lecture is really a summary of the entire, oh, okay. entire yeah. thing, right? To, to give people a, an overview for those who don't have time and for those who do, just to give you a map to orient yourself in the landscape. So we're launching lectures two to seven this, okay. this holiday season in a month, month and a half. And lecture number seven is going to be whole two hours on Gerard's concept of the apocalypse and why he thinks it's happening. So I'll, 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 uh, I'll yeah, update we'll, you. We'll run the experiment live there. in that case. Yeah, exactly. But maybe maybe let's get to that as our sort of final topic for the day and really delve in into why Gerard thought that the apocalypse was imminent. And for he, for this, in the same way that we gained a better understanding, or Gerard claimed that he gained a better under, understanding by tracing a genealogy of the economy into the gift giving. Also, I think we're going to spend the rest of our time today to trace the genealogy of warfare. Um, and, you know, war for Gerard is really an institution. 
that might be a very odd thing for, for a, a modern person to, to hear and think. Because when we hear institution, we think about rules, agreed upon behavior. But war seems to be something that is lawless, right? <laughs> but if you look back into antiquity, that was not always the case. War, um, if, you, if you recall, um, in ancient Greece, involved sometimes at least, and there are obviously outbreaks like the Peloponnesian War that are more crazy, but it often involved two general, like two generals, quote unquote, disputing over land, agreeing upon where they would actually go uh, and then agreeing upon a time or place and have two phalanxes jab each other until one of them retreats, right? Yeah. So it was almost like a rugby match. It was almost like a, a sport that could turn deadly. So I, that, that's the intuition I want to paint first. And basically, Gerard gets his theory of war through a reading of Karl von Clausewitz, the famous 19th century general and an opponent of Napoleon, contemporary of Hegel and Schelling. And for, for Clausewitz and for Gerard, war has two uh, components. One is the pure form of the war, okay, the form of the war. Definitely. And the other are frictions in the real world that prevent the pure form from manifesting. So the pure form of the war for Gerard is the duel. You take out your gun, I take out my gun. It's quick and it's a fatal escalation. That's right. But obviously war does not happen this way, right? War, war does not happen this way. The, the people stop, like there's peace treaties and Gerard's question is why? If, if the pure concept of war is you pull out your gun, I pull I'm, I'm out my gun, why does war not happen this way? Gerard's answer is that there's two sets of frictions. There's cultural frictions and there's technological frictions that prevent war from escalating, but both of those frictions have gone away. Let's start with the culture. They've gone, they've gone away now. They've gone away. Status exactly. quo, okay. These are, these are, these are, um, are you familiar with the idea of the catachon? No. So, so this is a Christian theological idea, and, and it's, you know, it appears a few times in the New Testament, but the catachon is something that's supposed to prevent the apocalypse. And, and so the catachon is supposed to be released or it's supposed to disintegrate. It's supposed to lose its power. And that's when, you know, apocalypse is coming. So these frictions are catachonic. They, they prevent war from escalating to, to sort of instant escalation. And, and there's, there's two types of frictions. Okay, Let, let's, let's delve into each of them and how they've gone away. The first type of friction is cultural frictions. That even if you and I are on different sides of the table, there are rules and regs, so to speak, not formally written international laws, there. but in, just in terms of the culture that we know what can't be done, even if it means victory or that I, I get to avoid defeat. So if you recall, in the 17th and 18th century, the wars were called gentleman wars. And the reason they were called gentleman wars was because war was almost like, for the aristocrats, a phase you go through in life. There was constant warfare. And much like people go to MBA these days, you would you would be a, a general or a leader in the military. And war was almost like um, like the playoffs, like the NBA or the NFL, where there were like seasons where you would go to war uh -huh. and then there were off seasons. And, and, and funny story here is, um, you know, when I'm when I'm campaigning and, and trying to kill you and then I'm lo I look at my watch and it's, it's winter and I, I need to go to my home, go back home because it's the off season. Uh, often I had to traverse through enemy territory, but often they would let me through their territory. That was what war was considered to be, right? right? Think back to the ancient Greek idea of the phalanx jabbing each other. It was like a more of a slightly more violent rugby match. Uh -huh. Let me leave you just with one image of, of how ingrained these uh, cultural frictions are in terms of escalation. Um, there was a colonel who was a sharpshooter uh, in, in the American Revolution. And he, this, the colonel was on the British side. And one day he was positioned and he sees these uh, American, uh, clearly uh, high status generals or commanders coming across and he did not shoot. And when, when he, what he wrote in his diary was that I found it off-putting, I'm paraphrasing here, but he said, I found it off-putting to shoot an unoffending general. Man. The general whom he let go turned out to be George Washington. <laughs> right. And he said that after he learned it was literally their like number one guy, he had no regrets. That's how ingrained 
this sort of this sort of gentleman war was like that there was this is the total opposite just, of exactly 20th century total war exactly exactly yeah. and what that would be like today right is like you know sir we have bin laden in our crosshairs should we fire and then you know the officer being like oh no it's a sabbath come on come on now right but that's completely unthinkable today we want to use every means possible to extinguish the enemy and the question is what caused this what caused the disintegration of these cultural frictions in warfare. Gerard's answer is Napoleon. In the Napoleonic Wars, it was the first time where mass conscription, uh, the idea that you know everyone in the Republic had to serve, and maybe it was through a lottery or something like that, that was created. Uh, before, it was you know militias, hired militias, or, or very localized conscription. Right. And also the idea of the total war emerged where let's say you weren't conscripted and you were an old lady or an old man in town, you were supposed to contribute to the war, war effort, whether it's through you know weaving uh, armory, whether it's through saying tales of the glories of your side. And this is actually because the war was so focused on extinguishing, right? In ancient Greek, Greek you jab the phalanx. If you win, you let them leave. But there was such an extermination. Uh, there was such an exterminating component to warfare that it actually led to uh, the first documented civ- civilian uh, uh, revolts behind the lines. So the, some, some of the conquered Spanish would form guerrilla. these guerrilla. It's where, it's where the, the exactly. word guerrilla comes from. Yeah. Exactly. Guerrilla. And, and this is actually, Gerard traces actually the, the invention of modern terrorism into, the, into, into Napoleon as well. So you can see that- One well, the quick thing Napoleonic- too, to, to, your, to your earlier yes. framework, you, you get at why the concept of a guerrilla or, or a partisan or an insurgent has always been so- in, almost uh, offensive right uh, right in many it's so ways, untasteful like the, it, right it, it's untasteful there's obviously no rules it's I, I like the use of the term like gentleman war because it's the least gentlemanly yeah, method of yeah. pursuing it's these this. like in the dark assassin's creed if you play that game <laughs> kind, of, yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of intuition and and so, so it's gerard thinks it's because of that 20th century uh sorry because of the uh, napoleon's total conscription that we've completely uh, moved out of those cultural frictions. And, you know, the one thing I'll say is that I think some of those cultural frictions exist even in World War I. Uh, have you heard that famous story where um, the Germans, I think, and the French were in trench warfare in Christmas Day, they played soccer together? Yeah. Right? Th- there's this. I- there's still an idea that there are certain things that y- you do not want to do. You don't want to pick out your pistols and people are playing soccer and shoot everyone, even though you are trying to kill them. Um, and... Uh, and so, yeah, so, so that, that's the first set of well, things. And the, well, the key thing away. to build on that example that, uh, you know, you're referring to, you know, Christmas 1914, um, like I, apparently this is me, like not an expert articulating, this wasn't as widespread as you would think, but the Christmas truce, right. it happens. They don't happen for the rest of the war because they are, to your broader point here, this gentlemanly off season, uh, mutual, there are these Respected, broader rules. Yeah. Is, right. is fundamentally incompatible with World War One era total exactly. war mass mobilization styles, and the the, exactly. the the commands of both sides prevent this from basically happening ever again. Exactly, that's precisely right. So the first set of frictions are already gone, right? And, and and what are the second type? And let me explain why these frictions are important. Gerard has this idea, and we talked about this already about the dangers of rapid acceleration. You give your gift today, I give my gift today. Um, and Gerard basically thinks what these frictions allow, these cultural frictions, is you know on the off season I, I, I cool my head and say you know that, that lord over there he's not so bad you know let, let's let, yeah. let's let's sue for peace right but if it's on like, if it's on, if it were like in a boxing ring yeah. right that's the opposite extreme there there wouldn't be such breaks so what these frictions both cultural and technological allow is for people to essentially chill out and and for the Gerardian psychology right where the social side of the spirited side of person is inflamed that's really all you can do because when that spirited side of you is inflamed reason really doesn't have a great grasp so you might be acting contrary to your reason and okay so what are the next set of frictions that also give opponents this room you know to, to really chill out so to speak and and get back on the negotiating table when there's less animosity the last is is just technological frictions you know whether it's commanding a uh, a, a Mongol horde, or even if it's Pearl Harbor, you, you need to, how many days was it from Japan? It was like three days or two days, something, right? There's there's a time that is required, even the age in the 20th century to sure. maneuver your troops, that for warfare, you couldn't, and I use the past tense here, you couldn't really unleash your entire entire arsenal all at once. Of course, what what allows us to do this? It's the nuke, right? The nuke allows us 
to unleash our entire nuclear arsenal all at once. And this is where I think people are a bit mistaken. The nuke is so new and terrifying, not because of its single destructive power, not because of the power of one nuke. If, that's, if there was only one nuke in the world, we wouldn't be that scared. Even in World War II, where the two nukes were used, as you know, the, uh, the greatest fatality actually, or, or rather, the fire bombing of Tokyo actually yeah. had a greater damage and fatality rate than even dropping either of the nukes. And so it's not the fact that the nuke has a singularly uniquely destructive power. It doesn't, right? The firebombing, you can, you can get just to get, get as good quote unquote, results from that as you can from a nuke. But the idea that it limits, it, it, it makes, it shortens the period of reciprocity between uh-huh. individuals. That is what is so scary for Gerard. It allows us, it allows nation states to fight wars like a duel. Before, nation states fought wars more like a boxing match, right? You have to move, maneuver a lot. You put in a lot of punches in, but you're, you're probably pretty tired before you can knock the person out. You know, maybe you get lucky once or twice. But with the nuke, nation states can fight wars like a duel. We just pull out our guns and shoot each other. In fact, it's almost even worse than a duel because even if you kill me, my nuclear submarines can avenge me post-mortem, right? That's what it means for mutually assured destruction. The hand. So, this is what Gerard has to say, and it's quite chilling. And once we explain it in these terms, apocalypse is no longer this distant, theological, incomprehensible, you know, Christian idea of the past. It's something that's facing us really day to day. It's basically the threat uh, of nuclear war with both of both those frictions removed. Does, once again, with your opening answer in mind, maybe the word solution isn't quite the right thing to apply here, but right. does Girardian thought beyond just nuclear abolishment? I mean, because it seems like the logical, the logical end point here would be just as we, you know, outlawed, we outlawed duels, um, you know, duels have been like right. both culturally and like literally legally, right. Um, right. duels were outlawed, um, in the West and by the like mid 20, mid 19th century, right. um, in the case here, would Girardian thought lead you to conclude that man, like somehow we have to get nuclear abolishment, or is it just like, right, a, right. or is it just that, on a pure mathematical basis, eventually, you will just have yeah. a nuclear apocalypse? Yeah, it's it's quite interesting. So, two things to say here: Girard himself became really pessimistic when he was working on these ideas. His final book is called "Battling to the End," and in French, it's called "Completing Clausewitz," <laughs> and he basically says, and these are my exact, these are exact words. The end will come. Sorry. The end of the world is, will come at our hands, but not in our control. So Gerard's apocalypse is not a theological one where God is smiting us. It will be uh-huh. through, through human means, but it will be out of humans control. We are, we are not in control. We are, we are uh, actors in a sort of frenzy. We're just forced to react. And so Gerard himself, the only, uh, uh, at least the way I read him, is that the only normative solution he gives us is retreat, withdrawal. The model he would have for that is uh, the, the other famous uh, 19th century poet, uh, Holderlin, who literally holed himself up in a tower for the last decades of his life. And Gerard's idea here, um, it really only works if you, if you buy into his Christian metaphysical framework, <laughs> is that, look, there's nothing you can do apocalypse is imminent to your point ah. the, the, we're, we're all going to get nuked uh we're all, we're, I, I actually don't know if, if he thinks we're exa- exactly the nuke that's going to do it but apocalypse like we're, we're we're clearly at the end of the world it's clearly going to come very soon and furthermore there's nothing you can do to stop it if you get involved if you get involved in politics and warfare that's only going to really muddy your own moral character <laughs> so the best thing you can do is to tend to your own garden in a Voltarian or like or sort of retreat like Candide uh, and to preserve your moral character because the kingdom of God is not going to be established on this earth, but you might as well preserve your character for it in heaven. And so that's what Gerard, uh, at least my reading of Gerard, um, that, that's what his position is. Yeah. But that's interesting. I'll, I'll make one more comment here on, yeah. the, uh, on, on this idea of abolition of, of the duel. Gerard, and we won't, we won't get into this, but this is touched upon in the last lecture because it intimately ties the three last institutions we examined in the last lecture that leads to Gerard's hypotheses of, um, of apocalypse is economics and war that we talked about, but also law. And the, the two second version of, of his understanding of the law is that law does not work because of consensus. 
Law does not work because of prestige or catharsis. Law works by the threat of greater violence. The idea here is this. You think that the laws right now in America where we live are sacrosanct, not because they're agreed by the people or or, or there's a rational process to derive them, but because if you break them, there's a threat of the state that you can't overpower. If you wrong me and then I take uh, you know, the justice into my own hands, private justice, the state's going to come after me. That's why I respect the law. And, you know, I, that this may be a bit too Machiavellian and cynical, but I don't think that's his conclusion then, of course, is that law only works when there is a more powerful party that has a monopoly over violence that can threaten the disputing parties. <laughs> and I don't think that's too far or, or, or that's at least directionally correct or interesting, if not correct. Because think about it, the laws within a state, within a well-run state, at least, are sacrosanct. But the laws between states, where no one has, where there's no monopoly over violence, they're transgressed left and right. The laws of the UN, the funniest, one of the, funny is not the right word, one of the most comedic uh, moments in the beginning of the Russian war was when the Security Council voted uh, whether whether Russia could invade Ukraine or not, and right? Of course they voted no, but of course Russia did it anyway. But do you, do you see the idea here? The same thing yes. goes with the Geneva Convention. It gets transgressed all the time, but because there's no monopoly, monopolizing force of violence that is there to punish disputing parties, laws, Gerard's think, don't have really a strong ground to stand. And when you and I are living in society where there is a monopoly of violence, namely the state that carries out law, we think that laws are grounded on reason or something like that. But at the end of the day, we don't transgress them because there's sort of literally physical force backing it. So this idea of ruling out nukes in the same way that we ruled out the duel is, is infeasible right. for Gerard for that reason. I think that's a, a helpful but I think ultimately not frustrating from a perspective of what you're articulating, right. but just, it reflects a broader dilemma that the world has reached and placed itself in at the moment. This is the, uh, this is a good time for, for a shout out. This episode is coming out, um, in November, obviously, but I'd love you to just give a, I don't want to even say a pitch because, you know, it's interesting when people are listening, you know, and at this point of the podcast, I'm sure they're bought into a certain degree, just what is some more about the lecture series? Like, hey, like, why did you even do, like, let's spend these last five minutes just actually going down the actual right. numbers. Like, why did you decide to do this specifically? Where should folks go to learn more? And like, what's the broader pitch for like the next six lectures that they want to go beyond just the YouTube one? Yeah, yeah. So, so all of them are going to be on YouTube. Um, the first lecture is about uh, two hours is really a summary of the entire series. So it can give you a really quick uh, idea, obviously truncated of whether these ideas are interesting or relevant to you. And the next six really try to cover the entirety of Gerard's theory. We, we do two lectures on Gerard's psychology, right? Focusing on this idea of metaphysical desire and all the implications there. Um, and that's where I feel like a lot of the more uh, people who are interested in self-help, so to speak, <laughs> would find value there. Then we have four lectures on Gerard's history. The first lecture is on Gerard's understanding of pagan society and how religions and gods are made. He takes a very psycholo- psychological view there. The second lecture is on Christianity. Gerard is going to mount an uh, apologetic of Christianity, defending it against all pagan religion. Uh, I think it's at least interesting, if not <laughs> uh, if not if not convincing. Um, the, the the sixth lecture is, I think, where most of your audience, knowing your your content, uh, is going to be interested in, and that's Gerard's modernity. Um, and he he ana- analyzes things like science and how it's become perverse, how the protection of victim has become perverse and how innovation itself has become potentially perverse or perverted in some degree. And the final lecture, I think we've covered a lot of ground um, already. For a lot of people, it'll be be like a second hearing where we examine the three institutions of war, of um, uh, capitalism, and of law to understand what Gerard thinks they, they really are, what the core logic behind them really is, and why he thinks that all of them are breaking down and we're heading towards apocalypse. Um, maybe we'll end with uh, uh, me just giving you an idea of why I created these lectures. Um, as you can tell, I'm somewhat frustrated. Uh, I'm clearly interested in contemplation, but I'm so- somewhat frustrated by by the academy. Um, so I, the, the period I'm in my life right now, I mean, there's a whole other side of me that wants to build things in the real world. And I've been building a startup for the last two and a half years. But there's the other side of me that's interested in knowledge and contemplation. 
Um, and what I'm really trying to do now is to try to find a medium to communicate sophisticated ideas um, outside the academy. And I think um, the lecture is probably the best bridge there <laughs> because if you if you wrote, like even Gerard's books, um, as popular as he is, is not well read out of the academy. Uh, and of the books that are popular in the public, I think a lot of them are quite trivial and you have to dumb them down really, right? right or lose a lot of nuance. But I think the intellectual lecture, there's been a lot of great uh, uh, precedents where you can basically give the same type of lecture you give to a group of Ivy League grad students uh, hold up in the high, the high towers of the academy and you, you would release them and basically everybody could be interested in that type of sophistication. So that's a yeah. medium where you don't have to sacrifice sophistication to, to gain uh, accessibility. So I jokingly say, uh, and I said this to David in, in our other interview a few days ago, 90% of the reason why I did the lectures was just joy. I just have a lot of joy and contemplation, figuring things out. And I think these are, as we discussed, hopefully you can see some of it are important questions, I think. And then 10% of this is really me trying to shamelessly self-promote myself and to gain okay. an audience. And I'm quite, I'm quite upfront about my own uh, perverse desires, if you, if you want to call it that. But I hope that answers your question. No, it does. Um, Jonathan, this has been really, really great um, for members of the audience. The link to the released lecture is available. And uh, when the rest of them are released in December, we will re-up everyone because I think this is incredibly interesting. And by the way, just as a podcaster, I'm interested in folks who are kind of doing different styles of production. Like it's it's funny when I uh, started podcasting, my dream was to be like a PBS host or something like that, host right. to like a big show. And at some point it just kind of clicked for me. It's like, wait a second, to your point of mimetic thought, you were just idealizing that as your path because that feels cool. You know, a side of you that feels guilty about going to a state school and not an Ivy League school would feel like, you know, really bumped up. The A, you showed them you were wrong, Mrs. Tyra. I always was intellectual right. back in high school, but you can actually do this on YouTube, right? Like I could book people, right. you got the same conversation. So I, I just really like this idea that you came forth during the, like, let's say the self help part of the conversation or like really trying to revisit your underlying beliefs and focusing more on like the the physical. Um, and in this case, it's, I like talking to smart people. I don't need to go to WNYC in New York to do that. Right. And the fact right. is too, to your point about technology and culture, you know, what's that on a positive note, uh, right, right. technology and culture are deeply scary in the context of, of an apocalypse. If you're interested in doing what we do, tech and culture actually are in our favor. In the sense that, you know, I've got a $200 mic here, you know, you're, streaming from your laptop camera and people who are listening to the show are not going to have their first question be, okay, where is his grad degree from? Oh, wait, right, he right. doesn't have a PhD. I'm not quite sure that he's, you know, all fraud for this, which right, is how this right. would have been pre-internet. So I think mean, that's right. optimistic for anyone who's interested in these intellectual projects. I think that's right. Well, thank you so much, Marshall. This has been, this has been fantastic. Yeah. Thanks for joining Jonathan. 